missed something sometime and it didn't turn out the way you wanted. In this day and time, it's comforting to know we have hope in something far bigger than ourselves. And especially during those times of despair. Remember, where there's life, there's hope. Welcome to Hope Church in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Thank you for joining us for our live broadcast. Now, let's join the service, already in progress. Probably a lot more credit than I deserve. I, you know, anytime I see someone in the Bible do something that's silly, or, uh, you know, you think, golly, that was really dumb, or say something that they shouldn't have said, I always say, well, you know, I wouldn't have done that. Right? We have the benefit of knowing the rest of the story. See, they had the experience of living through it in the moment. That's why you often hear me say, don't say to someone, I know how you feel. Whenever Thomas said something stupid, or Peter did something dumb, don't say, well, I would have never said that, or I wouldn't have done that, because you have no idea. You hope you wouldn't have said that. You hope you wouldn't do something like that. But the reality is you're not sure. And I can tell you based on experience that from human, a human perspective, it's probably more likely that we would than we would not. Because we have a tendency to do similar things, all of us. It's a human condition we have. We're we're kind of predisposed. And unless you are really, really, really somewhere in a different dimension in your walk with the Lord than most, you probably would. And even if you are in that dimension, chances are you would still. Paul talked about his own walk with the Lord in a couple of places. And he said that the Lord gave him revelation and the Lord had given him things that probably a lot of other Christians hadn't experienced. But even so, he, he brought him a challenge to help him stay humble so that he wouldn't become exalted. Well, you know, even if you don't make some of those natural human errors, chances are it's easy to fall into the conclusion that you're a little bit better than you really are. And I've been there, and I suspect that if we're all honest, we would admit that we've been there as well. I don't know if you can imagine what it would be like to walk and talk with Jesus physically as he made his way across Galilee. But if we could have been there, we would have seen him touch the sick. We would have heard him preach amazing sermons. We would have experienced him performing miracles. We would have seen people who were dead come to life again. We would have seen a little boy's lunch multiplied to feed thousands of hungry individuals. We would have seen Peter walk on water. We would have seen Jesus rescue him when he began to sink. Probably would have been amazing to do that. When the disciples saw Jesus perform miracles, though, and teach, they didn't clamor, Lord, teach us to teach like you oh lord teach us to heal like you or lord teach us to do miracles like you their question was lord teach us to pray i think it has been a mistake in my experience as a christian and some of the preaching and teaching I've heard through the years, there's a whole lot more emphasis placed on teaching like Jesus or healing like Jesus or doing miracles like Jesus than there is on praying like Jesus. And one of the reasons I think that's the case is because we are given toward things that are exciting. We're drawn toward things that are spectacular or supernatural or powerful. Or things that we feel bring testimony to the greatness of our God. Well, I think there's something to be said about what Jesus did that preceded most of what he said and most of the miracles he performed. And that's what he prayed. So today we're going to talk about that. We're still in the same series, My Way versus God's Way. 
talking about a choice that we have to make. And this morning we're going to talk about a message I've given the title, Talk This Way. Talk This Way. How many of you could probably stand a little improvement in the area of what you talk about? Anybody? Yeah. Several of us are honest this morning. The rest of us will have an altar call for liars. Talk this way. I want to read scripture to you from Luke's gospel. And then... We'll get right into this, and I promise I'll have you out before you know it. I'm not going to give you a time, though. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Begin reading with me in verse 1. It says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight, And you say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked, and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door is open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? They wanted to know how to talk to God in prayer. And Jesus gave them an answer to their question. Lord, help us to hear you today. Help our hearts to be open and receptive. Help our minds to be alert and responsive. Help your word to permeate and penetrate our minds and our hearts in such a way that it causes them to lodge into the soil of our soul. The rich, fertile, God-receiving, truth-imparting soil of our soul. Lord, help it to take root and grow strong and produce much fruit for your glory in your name. Amen. Talk this way. I have three points to share with you this morning. And under the first point, there are several, but we'll go through them quickly. The first point is a plan. Jesus gives us a plan for prayer. In verses 3 and 4, he says, Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Actually, it's verse 1 through 4. Excuse me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us. In the first four verses, we see the plan to help us pray. Now, I know there's been a lot of teaching on this. You've probably read books or seen books about this, heard lots of sermons about this. And if you were an athlete back in the 70s and 80s, you probably knelt down before a football game or a basketball game or a wrestling match. And as a group, coach would say, Cook, lead us out. And Cook would say, Our Father. And everybody would join in. That was kind of a common practice in our nation in years past. 
in a lot of cases around the country, people would pray this prayer on a daily, break, on a daily basis. In schools in the past, this was a common prayer that people prayed. A pattern for prayer. Or a plan. So I'm going to break this down in several points to help you with your prayer life. And this is what Jesus taught the disciples. The scripture says, after he had finished praying, the disciples came and said, Lord, teach us to pray. So before he went and did miracles, he prayed. Before he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, he prayed. Before he raised the dead, he prayed. In fact, if you watch Jesus' life on a consistent basis, you find him praying. In some cases, it happens, it, and it shows it in the text. He went out to, to Lazarus' tomb, and before he went to Lazarus' tomb, the Scripture says he prayed. But we don't always emphasize the prayer aspect of Jesus' ministry because we're focused upon the supernatural elements and the spectacular things. But the reality is, if there's ever to be anything powerful in our lives, it's going to be because it is rooted in prayer. It's built upon a foundation of of prayer. If we want to walk in victory in our lives and for our Christian experience to be something where we experience wholeness and joy and victory over the struggles of this life and over temptation and over frustration and all the different stuff that comes our way, we have to be people of prayer. The very first thing Jesus taught on prayer was praise. Praise. Verse 2. Whenever you pray, Say, Father, hallowed be your name. Acknowledge God. Acknowledge His supremacy. Give Him the glory that He's due. See, we have a tendency to sometimes cut right to the chase. We live in a culture that values the bottom line, and we don't really value the context sometimes. We value the, the last chapter, but we don't want to read the whole story that led up to that moment. We like the bottom line. Just give me the nuts and the bolts of it, Pastor, and get me out of here. Jesus said, start first things first. Give God the glory that He deserves. Acknowledge Him. Praise Him because of who He is. Praise is important because we have to remember and honor the Lord. He's the creator of all things. He's the giver of all good gifts. He's the one from whom all perfect and good things come. There's no darkness in Him. There's no shadow in Him. There's no evil in Him. And you know what? He loves you. He loves you. All throughout Scripture, we see examples that remind us of His love and His affection toward our lives. It's a good thing to honor and worship and praise God whenever you pray. Start your prayers out with praise. Second thing, purpose. Why do we pray? See, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time trying to decide and figure out, why am I here? What is my purpose? Let me tell you, our chief purpose of existence is to bring glory to God in everything that we do. In living and in dying, we should endeavor to glorify God in everything that we do. That's your purpose. Some people search and go to school and try to figure out what is my purpose. And there's nothing wrong with searching. And there's nothing wrong with honing your skills. There's nothing long, wrong with learning things. But God has already given you a purpose. His purpose is to glorify Him. And how do you do that? Your kingdom come. It's easy to forget that we have a responsibility to fulfill God's purpose in the world. We get pretty distracted and preoccupied with our own interests. Rhonda talked about it a little bit earlier in one of the transitions. She said, we want to be in control. One of the primary elements of a, of a successful prayer life, of a fruitful life for the Lord, is a life that surrenders, just like the song said. You see, we acknowledge God for who He is, and that reminds us of His greatness and His glory. And then secondly, we remind ourselves that while we're concerned by the things that we want, God is concerned with the things that He wants. 
And that should be our priority as well. And whenever his priorities become our own priorities, then we begin to see this this healthy interaction and relationship, this back and forth, this give and take, this responding to one another in a relationship that brings us joy. We should be mindful and sensitive about the work of God in His kingdom each and every day. Every day. It's important for us to be engaged in the work of the Lord. You say, well, what's the work of the Lord? Well, there's lots of ways we could be involved in the work of the Lord. Encouraging someone who's discouraged. Letting someone know that you're praying for them. Or maybe just praying for them, even if you don't let them know. Partnering with the Lord by responding to that prompting inside your heart that often comes from the Holy Spirit. Reading the Word of God and letting its application wash over you and remind you of the things that you're to be a part of in order to be a successful participant in His kingdom. That's part of the purpose. That's part of the purpose. Third thing in this plan for prayer is physical needs. Verse 3, give us this day our daily bread. This is an area we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy on. And this is probably the area that we start and focus on the most in our prayer life if we're praying. And some of us don't pray until we run out of bread or dough or cash or however you want to describe it. But this is really the, this is a tertiary concern. This isn't the primary concern. Primary concern is, is your heart attuned with the Lord? Are you in a right relationship with Him? If you're in a right relationship with Him, you'll care about the things He cares about. Are you worried about His kingdom? Are you focused on the things of God? Are you concerned by and interested in those things? And if you are, then you don't need to worry about where your next meal is going to come from. One of the promises that gives us hope is that God supplies our needs. When we pray, it's part of the instruction that Jesus gave to the disciples that we ask the Father for the things that we need. We should ask Him. He wants us to. But that shouldn't be our primary concern, our primary focus. In fact, if we're trusting the Lord properly, those things are just kind of, again, they're, they're in passing. They're not a huge priority that we're focused upon all the time. The fourth thing, spiritual needs. Spiritual needs. There's not a day goes by that we should not be thankful for God's forgiveness and mercy and grace and blessing and salvation. A healthy reminder to each of us concerning that area of our lives is to practice consistently forgiving people. Now, I know some people are probably saying, well, I'm not, I don't have any unforgiveness in my heart. I'm not offended by anybody. Well, watch the news. You'll get offended. Get on social media. You'll be offended pretty fast. Have a tense exchange with someone. Listen, don't let that stuff get on you. You know, shake it off. I remember whenever I was a kid in, in P.E. class, in elementary school, Coach Bale was his name. Big Native American guy, stocky Pawnee tribe. And Coach, Coach Bahel, he'd, he'd have a shake it out, you know? Just shake that stuff off. Lord, forgive me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that cleanses me from all sin. Thank you, Lord, that you have saved me and sanctified me for your service. And you've transformed my life. You have transferred me from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of your dear son. I'm walking in the light as Jesus is, in, as, as Jesus is the light. Your word is flowing in me. I have fellowship with you and with other people. Lord, thank you for salvation. And Lord, I forgive so-and-so for what they said, even though they didn't know that it bugged me. Thank you, Lord, for, for blessing them. Thank you, Lord, for helping them. Thank you, Lord, for all those people I don't agree with, for helping them to figure it out. And if they have questions, they should ask me. I can educate them. 
Some of you are not following me very close. Or you're just afraid to laugh. Listen, your spiritual needs are something that's important. The sin that has been forgiven has made you free in Him. Don't carry it around anymore. God provides for our spiritual needs. Don't neglect to ask for help. Another part of this prayer, protection. Verse 4, protection. And do not bring us into temptation. You guys have heard me say it many, many times. I pray for my kids every single day. Every day. I pray for them. Jaron gets up too early for me to pray for him because I'm not getting up at 5.30 with him whenever he goes to work. But I pray for him every day. I send him a text. I prayed for you, son. Love you. And I pray some sort of pattern of prayer in these things. I pray for them spiritually. I pray for them physically. I pray for them for their safety and protection in, in those categories as well. I pray for Dason every, every single day. He could probably quote the prayer. But I pray for him and say, Lord, protect him. Protect him from evil in this world. Guard his heart. Guard his mind. Help him to know the truth and to discern rightly between things that are true and things that are untrue. And of course, Lord, keep him safe and free from injury physically. Something to that effect. I pray every single day. Let me tell you something. Praying for God to protect you from evil is a good prayer. There's plenty of evil in this world. There's plenty of stuff to get bogged down in. And we get moving really fast. You ever watch a movie where, or a TV show where maybe they're running and they're trying to get away from something that's, that's uh, chasing them and, and they're frightened and all of a sudden they find themselves bogged down in quicksand? Back in the 70s and 80s, quicksand used to be a big, a big scene in a lot of movies. A lot of TV shows, and all of a sudden, oh my goodness! And now, and then, the more they move, the deeper they sink, and the faster they go down. I've seen it in cowboy movies. Movies. I've seen it in Gilligan's Island. I've seen it in Indiana Jones movies. And I mean, it's been in all kinds of things, from the silver screen to the just the boob tube, quicksand, running and trying to get through life, trying to take care of responsibilities, trying to do all the stuff you have to do, and all of a sudden, boom! What do you do? It's a good thing to pray, Lord, lead my steps. Lord, protect me. Don't lead me into temptation, Lord. Deliver me from the evil one. Don't lead me into temptation, Lord. Protect me from the, from the snare, from the, from, the, from the net that's out there trying to get me caught up. Protect me, Lord, from the arrows of the evil one. It makes sense. That the same loving, compassionate, kind, forgiving Savior who goes to great lengths to establish a meaningful, healthy, loving relationship with you would want to protect you from the evil that the enemy has in mind. I say it on a regular basis. The devil doesn't like you. And his goal is to hurt you and to kill you and to take you to hell. That's his whole purpose for existence. He isn't there to be your buddy or to be your friend. Pray that prayer. Lord, do not lead me into temptation. Deliver me from evil. So we have a plan for prayer. The next point, we have a parable for prayer. <clears throat> a parable for prayer. Verses 5 to 9, he said, Suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to set before him. Then the one on the inside answers, Don't bother me. The door's already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. And Jesus said, I tell you, though he will not get up and give it to you because he is a friend, yet because of your boldness, he will get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Jesus takes this little bit of time here at the end of his pattern for prayer, the purpose of prayer, and he gives a parable. 
for prayer. To give us a picture that, like the man in the parable, we all have needs. And when we have needs, we ask for help. Has anybody ever had to ask for help? Yeah? You know, it's a funny thing. We teach our kids to ask for help when they need help, and then whenever we get older, we think we shouldn't ask for help anymore. You know what that is? That's pride. Now, we're okay to ask the Lord for help, but if He doesn't do some sort of a shaft of light from heaven and, you know, a thunderous lightning strike, then we're not receiving help. Let me just remind us all, the way God helps His people is through His people. <laughs> say, that, say this with me. Say, Dear Lord, help someone through me. That's how God helps. He helps people through people. And whenever we help people, we're doing the work of the Lord. You see, Jesus takes the time to explain the importance of persistence in prayer. Why? He wants us to know He's always willing to listen. It's never too early. It's never too late. He's never annoyed. He's never going to say, well, my kids are in bed and I don't want to mess with you. That's the point. He says, you might go to a friend and a friend might respond this way, but even if he responds that way and doesn't want to do it because he's your friend, he'll do it because of your boldness. Well, I'm already up. And the Lord's saying, don't think that I feel that way. I don't feel that way about you. I love to hear from you. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep trusting. Keep believing. So that's your parable for prayer. Jesus wants you to know the importance of persistence. Keep it up. Keep it up. Somebody said, well, you know, if it's a real prayer of faith, you only need to ask once. Well, either a lot of people don't have faith, or we haven't understood all that so much. Now, do I, do I think it's possible? And do I see some examples of people that asked once, and all of a sudden it happened? I do. I see some things like that in Scripture, and I see some things like that in real life. But I also see plenty of instances where that doesn't always work that way. Guess what? Be persistent. Keep knocking. Keep asking. Keep persisting in the Lord. Seek Him. Seek Him. Seek Him. I prayed for people to be saved. And guess what? Some of them aren't saved yet. I'm keeping on. Lord, save them. Third thing, a promise for prayer. Verses 10 to 13. Everyone who asks receives, who seeks finds. The one who knocks, the door is opened. Which of you fathers, if your own son asks for a fish, that you give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, you give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? He concludes this lesson on prayer by sharing with His disciples the principle of asking and receiving. Asking and receiving. See, some people are good at asking, they're not real good at receiving. Some people ask, and they ask amiss. They don't really expect that they're going to receive, but they figure, eh, I'll give it a whirl. Just throw it up against the wall and see if it sticks. That's how some people pray. James said, don't be double-minded. Don't pray that way. Double-minded person is unstable, tossed about, easily distracted and swayed from their, from their faith. Don't be like that, man. Be a person that whenever you pray, 
you pray with expectation. You pray with confidence. You pray with trust that the Lord is going to do something good. Does that mean everything is always going to work the way that you had envisioned it? Probably not, because our thoughts and our ways are not the same as God's sometimes. Sometimes what I'm praying for, God sees something differently than I see. I think it would really help us a lot if in the context of these kinds of prayers, we remind ourselves, you're God and I'm not. I trust you, even though I have kind of a plan here that I want you to follow, God, I trust you more and I trust your plan more than I trust in my own. And, and somehow or another, I, I have confidence that you're going to work in my circumstance. And the promise of prayer reminds us that our Father wants to give good things to us. And he uses an example and he says, you, even though you're evil. Now, that doesn't mean that you're an evil person. That means that you are a broken, frail human who lives in a world that's broken, where things aren't perfect. And we make mistakes. But we love those who are part of our own flesh and blood. And he says, if your kid asks you for some food, you're not going to give them something that's going to harm them. You're going to do everything you can to help them because you love them. He says, if you know how to do that, even though you're in the condition you're in, how much more will your Father, who's in heaven, give this to you? So don't allow yourself to become weary as you pray for things. Don't allow yourself to be intimidated by the struggle. Don't allow yourself to get discouraged. And remember this, prayer pleases God. If our churches don't pray, and if people don't have an appetite for God, what does it matter how many people come? If churches don't pray, and people don't have a desire to live for the Lord and bring Him glory in their lives and testify of His goodness and lead others to Christ, what does it matter whether we hit all the notes just right? Or whether our harmonies are on point. Or whether we have good videos or cool lights. Or even if there's climate control. None of that stuff matters. God values these things differently than we do. And if we don't want to experience a closeness with God here on the earth, why would we want to experience His presence in eternity? I mentioned this some time ago. I, I may have told you. I don't remember. I have had a couple brain surgeries. <laughs> but I remember a friend of mine that was a roommate at one time. I remember looking at his Bible one day. and Inside the front flap of his Bible, <laughs> his mom had written instructions for what to do if you miss the rapture. <clears throat> this is back in the 80s you know so lots of movies and things of that nature and uh anyway i was always humored by that because this guy and he's serving the lord today but at the time he was definitely not serving the lord and and uh we kind of fussed about things <laughs> And I remember saying to him, I said, brother, if you don't have the courage to walk with Jesus now, when the church is here and the Holy Spirit is testifying of God's goodness and there's fellowship with other Christians, what makes you think you're going to have the courage to go out and proclaim your witness for Christ if you miss the rapture? If you're not interested in serving Jesus whenever Jesus' people are here, what makes you think all of a sudden you're going to be interested in serving Jesus when all of Jesus' people aren't? It's probably going to be the, the exact opposite because if you're scared to serve Him now with like-minded believers to fellowship with and to support and encourage you, 
How much more are you going to be terrified whenever you're the only one? If you really are here. Say, what's your point, Pastor? My point is this. If we don't desire God, if we don't have a desire to fellowship with Him, to commune with Him, to enjoy fellowship with His people, to grow closer to Him now, if there's no longing in our heart for a deeper fellowship with the Lord now, what makes us think we'll have a desire for that in eternity? God has created us now to live in the kingdom of God. To experience the glory of God. To testify of the greatness of God. And to demonstrate the power of God. And these things only happen whenever we're walking in fellowship with God. And these aren't things that are supposed to happen in eternity because when we get in eternity there'll be no need to testify of the greatness of God there'll be no need for the power of God to be manifested anymore because we'll all be there he's called us he's purposed us he has commissioned us to live in this today to walk in this authority today and the way that we experience that and the way that that's cultivated and the way that is brought to fruition and fulfillment It's through a beginning place of prayer and fellowship with Him. Would you bow your heads? Lord, we're grateful to You. We're grateful to You for Your grace and for Your glory. For the truth of Your Word and for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For the power of the anointing that comes into the heart of every single person who gives their life to Jesus. I pray for your people today, Lord. I pray for all of us that we would acknowledge and recognize your plan. Your plan for prayer, Lord. That we would acknowledge you as supreme that we give you the glory you deserve, that we'd be mindful of the reality that you're concerned about our spiritual lives, our physical lives, our, our walk with you, and that your plan and purpose is greater than the things that we sometimes become distracted by. Remind us that you're God and we're not. And Lord, whenever we're concerned and we feel like our prayers are not being answered, help us to be persistent. Help us to not give up. Help us to not become weary but to testify all the more of the greatness of who you are. Not be discouraged, but to keep pressing in. How many here this morning would say, you know, I've kind of been discouraged lately. I feel like my prayer life has been really, really difficult. and Maybe it's because you prayed and things haven't happened the way that you want them to. Maybe you need to forgive God. Maybe you're frustrated or hurting. Maybe you've just not been persistent and you recognize, I need to pray and be more persistent in my prayers. But how many would say, Pastor, pray for me. My prayer life needs the Lord's help. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I need the Lord's help. I need the Lord's help. Well, stand with me, would you? I'm going to ask you to lift a hand toward heaven because that's where the answers come from. And in your mind, I want you to picture yourself as you lift your hand up toward the Lord. I want you to just picture Him reaching across and taking you by the hand. And I want to remind you that all power in heaven 
and on earth has been given to him. And you're holding the hand of the one who holds all authority in his name. And his invitation is for you to call upon him at any time and for any reason. And to call upon him as frequently and as repetitively as your heart desires. So God, we cry out to you today. Jesus, Jesus, we need you. Lord, we need your help. We need your strength. We need your grace. We need your glory. We need your healing. We need your protection. We need your provision. We need your safety. We need your healing touch. Your comfort. Lord, you see our hearts. You see our hands. You know our lives. There's nothing that's hidden from you. Touch your people, Lord. We acknowledge you for who you are. You are great. You do miracles so great. There's no one else like you, Lord. We surrender to you. We surrender to you, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for your mercy that you've given to us. We don't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. We can't repay it. Yet you freely gave it to us anyway. And again and again and again and again, you offer it to us. Thank you today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Go with us now, Father. Guide us by your Spirit. Pour out your glory in our lives. Help us to live our lives with purpose, on purpose for you. Mindful of the fact that you have created us to glorify you in this earth. Let it be so. And may it be done in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Thanks for being with us today. And remember, 